I'm Sally Osberg. I have the great privilege of being the president and CEO of the Skoll Foundation. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this conversation this morning. And it's a conversation that's going to be kicking off a series of conversations about the future of media. And we very much hope it's going to be informative, provocative, illuminating, and galvanizing, because we know that's what's, that's what's needed at this moment. I don't have to tell you, but democratic societies have always relied upon free, fair, open, open press and media. And probably many of you know Thomas Jefferson's famous quip about the uh, choice, if he had a choice between government without a free press and a free press without government, he would readily choose the latter. So he understood, and I think all of us understood, just how high the stakes are at this moment. Commitment to media has uh, been central to the formation of democracies, and it's also been front and center to, to Jeff Skoll and to his organizations. Um, as most of you know, Jeff is the founder of his own media company, Participant Media, and it's really no accident that several of participants' most um, compelling films have focused on the vital role that media plays in society, and many of you have seen many of these films, um, but a few examples, Good Night and Good Luck, about Edward R. Murrow, um, Citizen Four, about Edward Snowden, Zero Days, about Stuxnet, Page One, Inside the New York Times, well, what do you think that one's about? And then last year's uh, Best Picture, Spotlight, one of the great stories of the importance of journalism in our time. At the Skoll Foundation, we're also really proud to count several of the organizations represented in this room as longtime media partners, working largely with our uh, team member, Sandy Hertz, who's, who's, right, who's right over there. Uh, and we also include some very uh, uh, innovative media organizations like Global Witness in our social entrepreneur uh, portfolio, and, and Patrick is, is right over there. And then we've made storytelling for impact a real cornerstone of our, of our overall strategy at the foundation. This work, your work, couldn't be more important. We all know that mainstream media is buckling under pressures from all sides, economic, political, 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 and technological. But we didn't come this morning to wring our hands or despair. We'll talk about how to address all those pressures, and we'll talk about recent changes in technology, in access to information, in the roles of citizens and civil society, and how we have the potential to outmaneuver the bots and the memes, the zealots, and the wingnuts, and the money, especially the money. These are troubling, but firing up times. So let's get this conversation started. But first, let me acknowledge a couple of, a couple of folks. Um, Susanna Grego, here in, the, here in the front. Susanna, stand up and take a bow. So you all know. Oh, yeah, she it was Susanna who took, the, who took the lead in partnering with um, Marina Gorbis at the Institute for the Future in convening a real landmark um, uh, a gathering in January on the future of media, and that's really what spawned the idea for this track, and Susanna has been responsible for curating all the sessions that, that are about to follow. And then I also want to uh, introduce our good friend, um, Pat Mitchell. Pat has been a longtime friend of, of Jeff's and of mine and of Jeff's organizations. She is probably known to most of you as the, um, as the uh, former president of CNN Productions, the first woman president of uh, PBS, um, a pioneer for women's leadership overall. She's been the curator of, uh, of TED Women and, of course, a pioneer leader in the in the media world. And in January of this year, uh, Pat became a director of the Skull Foundation. Pat, it's, it's uh, wonderful to have you. And thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much, Sally. And as usual, thanks to the Skull Group, the participant media, uh, and the Skull Foundation for always understanding that 
Stories well told do compel social change. And certainly the films that Sally mentioned and the work of the Skoll Foundation and the work that's represented in this room is a good indication that we all believe that. And we also all believe, that's why we're here so early in the morning, that this system that produces reliable, trustworthy stories, stories that we can believe, stories that inspire us to create social change, that those are endangered in a way that perhaps is more dangerous than any that we've experienced in our lifetime. As Sally was talking, I kept remembering that scene from the movie Network. Do you all remember Ned Beatty? Are any of you old enough to remember <laughs> the, <laughs> that great scene when he says, he says, there are no networks. There's only one ecumenical ecosystem of money. <laughs> That's where we are. Uh, the, but we're not going to stare down those challenges entirely this morning. We're going to give us some reasons to be hopeful that the free and independent societies and cultures, the better world that we look to create and build together is still possible, and we know it is not possible without trusted media. Wherever it comes to us, from whatever form we consume, create, or distribute it, we must believe. And we know now, all data indicates, that trust in the media is at an all-time low. So it's encouraging that the Skoll Foundation takes this leadership position, and thank you, Susanna, for creating this track and making it possible for those of us who care so deeply to be a part of this conversation. And we also know that other groups represented in this room are responding equally and compellingly to this challenge. And one of them is a friend of Jeff Skoll's, Pierre Omidyar, with whom he helped build eBay. And both of these men have taken their capacity, their resources, but more importantly, their vision to create the kind of support systems that do, in fact, sustain a free and open society through a free and open access to information that's reliable and trusted. So today, we get to make a very special announcement. The Omidyar Networks are announcing today a $100 million fund to address the issue of the trust deficit in media. And to tell us, yes. And to tell us more about it, uh, the thinking behind this fund and how it's going to operate, please join me in welcoming to our stage Stephen King. He's head of the Global Governance and Citizen Engagement Initiative at Omidyar Networks. A hundred million dollars always gets a deserved applause. Well, and so it should, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Pat. And this very specifically, as I read the press release uh, and talked with you earlier about it, is it, it did come out of the why now question, and the why now question begins with this trust at an all-time low. What was the thinking of the team at Omidyar? I mean, I think, <clears throat> as many of us in the room know, and as you've teed up so nicely, Pat, that you know, independent, impartial media is a really important um, bulwark against authoritarianism. And it's a really important uh, principle within open and inclusive societies. Now, we've seen that threatened, and we've seen that not only in the US, not only in Europe, but also around the world. So in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Nigeria. So, and as we've um, considered our work over the last 10 years, we've invested $220 million to date in governance and citizen engagement initiatives. And that's part of the billion dollars that um, the Omidia Network has invested over the last 10 years. <clears throat> so this has always been a really important part of our program. But I think we see a particular urgency now. Um, we've seen, as you said, the erosion of trust in institutions, in government, um, and also a kind of breakdown in trust between citizens and their government. And as you say, the uh, trust in media is an all-time low. I think the Edelman Trust Barometer said earlier this year that I think 82% mm -hmm. of people surveyed um, don't trust their media. So that f is really important to us. We need to restore that trust, um, and we think now is a really important time to do that. 
And you're doing it essentially by looking at three buckets of opportunities. So can we talk about each of those? Let's start with the, with the, tr the lack of investigative reporting and yeah. an investment in what we know is essential to an informed society. Yeah, and, and we've always um, taken you know, a view that investigative reporting is expensive, as many people in, in the media world will know very well, um, but it also that it really is a really important um, uh, part of the whole media scene. So it needs to be supported. And we feel here that philanthropic foundations and others need to step up and to support that. So the first um, grant that we're actually um, announcing is a grant of $4.5 million to the International Consortium I'm an investigative journalism. Gerard Ryle, the chief executive, is here. <clears throat> and I hope we'll, in the questions later, get a chance to, you'll get a chance to ask um, Gerard particularly about this. But um, they're the group behind the Panama Papers, as you know, and, and, and kind of various other initiatives. And we provide core funding to those organisations because we think it's really important that um, we give them the space to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the those are the kind of things that we'll be right. supporting there. And the second group is is combating something much on everyone's mind: hate speech, misinformation, fake news, alternative facts. Sure. How are you doing that? Yeah. So I think we've seen again. Um, a, a, we're really concerned about the growth of hate speech, and we've seen this in in Myanmar, where we work, um, where Facebook is being used to propagate hate speech against Muslim communities and and ethnic groups and so on. We've seen this in the U.S., of course. In in the UK. I mean, there was a kind of tragic attack last week um, um, here in the UK. So what we'd be looking at is how can we use technology to try and tackle some of those issues? How can we provide ways in which we can combat um, uh, the, the growth of hate speech? So one of the things we're also announcing is a, a grant to the Anti-Defamation League in the US, which is setting up a centre in Silicon Valley to work with technology companies to try and find imaginative ways to combat the growth of hate speech, particularly through social media. Media channels. And the third bucket I loosely describe as citizen engagement, governance issues, and in what way is media a part of that yeah. work? So, so the third group is around what we call civic technology. So we've invested over the last 10 years in a number of different platforms which enable citizens to be better informed about their government by using these, these platforms. So an example for those of you in the UK is My Society which has produced a series of a very innovative um, uh, websites called They Work For You and What Do They Know? These are freedom of information sites and sites which allow you to track the, 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 the performance of politicians and are they keeping their pledges and so on. A group that we support in, in the US, which is a for-profit um, organisation, is called C Click Fix. And it allows you to, if there's a burnt out car or a problem in your neighbourhood, you, <clears throat> you can take a photo, upload it to the site and the relevant local authority will be able to deal with it. So these are somewhat, they seem trivial issues, but the use of technology here restores trust between citizens and their government. And we th think this is a, a really important thing now to be supporting. And I can see the minds uh, and the work in this room catalyzing around these three opportunities. So how does one apply for this right. $100 million grant? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I knew you'd ask that. Um, so, so what we have is a network of, of offices around the world. And I want to stress this is a global um, commitment that we're making. So <clears throat> we have you know, our, our colleagues working on our governance and citizen engagement teams in, in Africa, in Latin America, in um, South and Southeast Asia, and so on. So um, we, uh, the first approach is through them. Um, and we will be also reaching out through our networks to make sure that we contact the right people. We are looking for innovative, <coughs> experimental ideas. And one of the things that we at Media Network like to do is to take risks. Um, and I think this is now the time to take those kind of risks. Well, we, un we imagine you'll be hearing from some people in this room uh, with good ideas. Thank you for sharing that important announcement with us. And Stephen's not going anywhere. He's going to join Thank our very back. large panel. Um, because there's so many people who are already involved deeply in answering the challenges that we've already mentioned. So I'm going to step down and ask this very large panel to quickly take their seats and to ask each of you in the room to refer to the bios that are on your tables because we aren't going to take time uh, introducing each of them and the work that they do, but the brief bios that are on the the papers, and if you don't have one, we can arrange to get you one before you leave the room. Uh, that way we can dive very quickly um, into 
the challenges that have been outlined in so many different ways. I mean, everything from looking at our social platforms being weaponized with propaganda narratives to the personal attacks that are completely um, diminishing the important issues of the day. There's so many issues and so many ways in which we can look at what Time Magazine very quick is truth dead. Well, we do worry about that, and we worry about it for all the very good reasons. And so this is a panel of experts who are going to help us think about it. But first, we're going to talk about what's keeping them up at night. There are so many issues that we can have. I ask them to think about, if you could just say the one thing that when you wake up at 3 AM, what's on your mind? Uh, Drew, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I guess I guess we're an investigative reporting organization, so you know, we're really concerned about a gap that, that's widening between government and business and reporters, and the, the, the tools and the technology used to, you know, study someone like Donald Trump on deadline are just don't exist in in media. And what what our concern is is that in the future the governments and the industries will have the power to manipulate and use information, and we, the people and journalists, will not. And it's kind of like you can't hold people accountable if you can't reach them. It's like, it's like attacking airplanes with bows and arrows. And so um, our, our real concern is that the kind of information technology investment in journalism is, is really not being made. We're still doing things the old-fashioned way, um, and we're concerned that that's going to make us increasingly irrelevant, and we're seeing places where it's just very easy to hide things from journalists now um, that it didn't used to be, and that's very scary. And Drew's going to lead a, a delegate-led session later, and at the end of this, we're going to tell you a bit more about that. Uh, Laura, you uh, represent, for lack of a better term, let's describe it, the independent media world, meaning that you are trying to do this on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have a few so you must wake up with a lot of thoughts at yeah, 3 a.m. I mean, in the morning. You, you, what, you mentioned the... um, airplanes, you know, and I, I, my fear at night is that I will be like Orville Shell. Uh, uh, at the Wright brothers, or the Wright, rather, the, the Wright brothers. At the, at the, <laughs> well, at the sure birth of, not a bad idea. The either. birth of flight, you know, where mm -hmm. they believed that if we could just see into the backyards of our neighbors and people in other countries, we wouldn't bomb them. And we're at that moment where I feel like we have all the capacity, and I work in the independent media world. In the U.S., there is a sort of subterranean level of independent media that represents people all across the country. We have over 300 stations, radio stations, in heartland states where you can hear Rust Belt kids confront their officials, where you can hear local imams come on and explain Islam. Um, and yet those stations have no capacity really to connect with a national audience. Uh, we do our best with a network of independent television and cable stations that, again, have been built into the system, but it's the very system that's in, pro in danger right now. So in the sense that we have endangered species of investigative reporters and, and truth um, and combating hate speech, what I'm concerned about is the ecosystem has no glue, doesn't have the glue to connect us across the country. I went into this business um, kind of like Orville Wright, you know, like I wanted to look into people's neighbor, into people's backyards. I wanted to introduce people to each other. Um, that's still my mission, but I, I fear that like the Wright brothers, I'll grow up to see my beautiful technology used to bomb Dresden, um, which was never the idea. So that's where I worry at night. And the idea of what kind of ecosystem there might be an opportunity to create now because of the challenges yep. being faced by what some people call mainstream media, but which most people now call corporate media, yep. um, is part of the conversation that Laura and I and others on the panel will be holding later too. And again, at the end, we'll just remind you of these two delegate-led uh, sessions because uh, they're an opportunity to go deeper than we'll be able to do in our time today. Uh, Marina uh, was a partner with the Skoll Foundation in convening the first Future of Media look, and that convening brought together executives from media companies, technologists, policy uh, thinkers, people who were looking, staring into this abyss of the lack of truth and reliable information and saying, what happened here? Uh, Marina, so you, that day, along with all of us who were there, had some surprises about what happened here. How do we get to this place? And that must be a part of what you're worrying about in the middle yeah. of the night. And the reason this convening came up is because 
two days after the elections, we actually happened to have this gathering at the Institute of a small group of people, technologists from Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft, I, you name it, all the Silicon Valley, um, people thinking about the future of technology and a few policy people. And the conversation was focused on computational propaganda, which has now become the conversation, basically the use of bots and algorithms to shape what we see and how we see news. And the thing that struck me from that was that some of the technologists in the room basically said, that's just first generation. This stuff is going to get yeah. more powerful, it's going to get more pervasive, more con convincing, it's going to get more emotional, it's going to negotiate. And that just scared me a lot. So at that point, I called Susanna and said, we've got to do something about that. And that really is top of my mind right now. I think that from looking at technologies and kind of how technologies evolve, we know that every generation of technologies is going to be used, the same technologies is going to be used for evil and for good. And I think we're in this fight right now of who is going to use these technologies in what way. And I also kind of beginning to think that what we also need to focus on, you know, as much as combating fake news and propaganda and all of those things, I think we need to start thinking, how do we build an immune system? It's not all about technology. What do we need to build in our society as an immune system to kind of, that people realize or they see this and put it in a different perspective? Mm -hmm. So I'm increasingly thinking about almost like evolutionary biology and biological models of how does nature combat mm -hmm. negative parasites and how do you do that rather as well as looking at technologies and all the effort to combat fake news and, and propaganda. Now we know why you run something called the Institute for the Future. <laughs> <laughs> but can we come back to that, Marina, because uh, that's so much on everyone's mind and how can we combat something that just seems so enormously huge and dark and hidden, uh, but we know it's driving our narratives yeah. every day. Uh, Rachel, I, when I think of the Guardian, I think that is one of the immune systems. <laughs> thank, goodness, thank goodness for the Guardian. Um, but you know, there's been a lot of news lately about the the um, vulnerable financial situation of the Guardian, and so um, along with that, what other things, thoughts are coming to your mind uh, at 3 a.m. Well, uh, certainly the vulnerable financial situation of the Guardian is, is top of mind for all of us right now. But um, you know, for The Guardian, which has grown so substantially over the, the last couple of years, we were first on digital and um, we have a monthly audience worldwide of 150 million people. 50 million of those people approximately are in the U.S. and it continues to grow. And, um, and we feel that's as much about our journalism as the way we tell our stories and we tell stories that others aren't telling. And we, we feel we're, we're very important um, uh, to, to our readers and, and to the world and to democracy. And we know a lot about that. We know, we know that... Um, the content that we produce in the U.S., largely about the U.S., is, is consumed at, at huge rates internationally, and it's important in international audiences understanding what we do. And equally so, the, go the global reporting that we do is of a nature that we don't find as much in U.S. media, and we bring that to the U.S. in a way that's also powerful and important. But, but truly, what keeps us awake right now is that we feel we've never been more, it's, our role has never been more vital. Um, you know, we're one of the few media organizations, certainly the only one of our size and scale, that describes ourselves as a liberal media organization and, and journalism in the liberal interest. And, um, and, and we do face, you know, quite a threat to our, our revenue model right now. We've, we've, we've benefited from the, um, our ownership, the Scott Trust, which provides, you know, an endowment, you know, support for us in perpetuity, but it certainly doesn't cover the scope and scale of what we need to be doing now. And as we're trying to cover the biggest story in the world, um, we're also confronting, you know, constricted resource and, and, and shrinking newsrooms and trying to make sense of what we do. And some of that is, you know, producing less, but pr making sure that the stories that we produce are the ones our readers want. But, you know, the, you, we're making lots of decisions like that all the time. For us, um, we've been thinking very hard about sort of what a revenue model looks like for The Guardian as we, as we look out over the future. Advertising has always been a slightly um, sketchy proposition for The Guardian because we turn down a lot of it. Um, I think anyone who works on the commercial side of our business feels that um, the word no slips out of the mouth of editors of The Guardian faster than any other word when it comes to you know, sponsorship or, or something like that. Um, 
we're, we're bolstered by, you know, the contributions from our readers and membership, but we're, you know, we're really uncertain about whether that will hold. Um, and we're thinking a lot about, you know, as a mission-driven org media organization, the role that philanthropy can play um, in helping to support us as we go forward, or at least key elements of our, of our reporting and our journalism. And we've just recently set up a 501c3 called theguardian.org, um, which will aim to both make it possible for us to think about the ways that an independent organization like theguardian.org can help us you know, find more resource to support our, our journalism and the journalism of other um, organizations that we're working with um, you know, to support democracy. But equally so, we think that as, as a legacy media organization and the reputation that we have, that there's a way that we can, um, we're in a powerful position to partner with local media organizations throughout Europe and, and in the US. And, you know, finding a way, especially through you know some of the innovation that we're seeing right now, especially in the philanthropic community, to foster those kinds of partnerships that could be powerful with you know with media outlets in the Rust Belt or or wherever we find them um, is is part of how we're thinking. But it's a challenging time. <laughs> but and you moved already to some of the ways that you are thinking of facing this challenge, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in the question and answer period, uh, which we will open up to this room. Patrice, uh, I started this by referring to the underlying root cause of so many of these challenges uh, being money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is your world as you make decisions about investments. So um, what are you thinking about in, in the middle of the night in, in terms of this relationship between money, profits, ratings, and media? First of all, uh, what keeps me up at night, I have to echo what Marina was saying. I think what keeps us at night, especially our organization, is the difference between an adaptive challenge and a technical solution. We are in the midst of an adaptive challenge. A technical solution is brain surgery. Somebody has dealt with it. They can actually, there's a technique. You get the person there. It's very complex, but it's the technical problem that can be solved. An adaptive challenge in which we are, um, the, the civic media crisis, whether, uh, and I'll explain that in terms of our organization, is much more complex. And I think what keeps me up at night is that we all, like-minded people on this subject, understand that we are in the midst of an adaptive challenge. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. And to play the role that you and Susanna have placed of placing people on the ecosystem of this, MDIF is a 21-year-old uh, nonprofit. Uh, despite being ink on my badge, it's a nonprofit. It was created by the vision of a gentleman from uh, the former Yugoslavia called Sasha Vucin. And the idea was to invest, to lend money uh, into the most independent voices in emerging democracies from Guatemala to Indonesia and to Suharto. We've deployed $150 million to 90 of these independent media ran by very courageous men and women and so forth. And that worked very well. So you could say basically a technical solution, a problem to that would be just more capital. We've aggregated 150 million capital of impact. We just put more. No. It doesn't work that way. Five years ago, we realized that this, uh, we hope we realized, we haven't found the solution, that this is an adaptive challenge by which um, <coughs> What used to work for legacy media, print, radio, and TV, and, include, and specifically in the emerging democracies, in, is actually changing. So we've created a, a $3 million fund to invest in these new digital news outlets. Is it perfect, Pat? No. Is it working all the time? In some cases and so forth. But I think we're in the middle of the process that I think that's the first thing. The last thing I want to say, so we got hit basically, like all of us actually, by the digital disruption five years ago, and we adapted, as I've just said, with a, an attempt to try and foster independent information, public uh, news information and public debate. Notice I didn't use the word journalism here. Foster that in the emerging democracies with the new digital disruption. I would la lastly said that the one thing that keeps us, um, the one digital, one disruption we probably saw coming with very weak signal <coughs> is populism. We, uh, we, we deal with that. I'll give you a last anecdote is that we bring together all these 150 media independent companies every two years together for peer control. And you could see the, the look in their face when they looked at us from the West and says, you're going to see. They mm. don't give up power so easily. You mm. will see. It was not irony. It was not revenge. It was not. It was a form of a tenderness and saying, you will see. So. Despite you know, all the concept of trust, I think there will be an issue of trust also that will continue degrading itself in the countries where we work in emerging democracy. I want to come back to that because it also ties into the rise of citizen journalism and all of the digital disruptions that, that seem to make societies more open and democratic. But in fact, uh, has that been, been the answer? 
Uh, Stephen, you talked about this before, but the, the, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the hope for $100 million of new money coming into the media landscape. That, 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 you know, it's a lot of money, but it's still a drop in the bucket of what is needed to answer all the challenges that we've heard so far. So how, how do you go about looking at collaborations and making evaluations of who gets this money for the, for the biggest return? Sure. I mean, I think the uh, the important thing to say here, is, and you've rightly pointed out, Pat, is that this is a lot of money, but it's also not a lot of money. And I think one thing that we also want to really um, underline is that we need others to step up to the plate as well. Um, we formed a, a media donors collaborative on a very informal basis with Open Society Foundations, Ford, Gates, Knight, MacArthur and Rockefeller. And we meet on a regular basis to compare notes and to, to also to strategize together because um, there's a certain amount we can do but there's also you know with the collective resources of those six organizations there's a lot more that we can do and we co-fund a lot of the same organizations we share ideas we sh we also look for minimizing the 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 effort that, that some donors will, will put on organ small organizations to do you know onerous reporting so if we can share with Ford Foundation or Open Society Foundation and say, look, just give us one report, you know, don't mm. do three, you mm. know, and don't do three every month, you mm. know, just just do one report. That's the kind of thing which we're hoping to try and to, to try and, and solve. So I think as we start to get better at that, as we start to collaborate more, and of course there are we have differences of opinion, we have differences of strategy, and so on. Um, we hopefully will see more people coming to the table and more commitments being made because. As I said earlier, this is really urgent. This is not something we can turn our back on, and this is something that if we don't act, then we'll see the situation getting worse. Many of those organizations, foundations you mentioned, are represented in this room. So I just want to remind everyone that in just a few minutes, I'm going to open it up to questions from you. So please be thinking about um, the challenges that have already been presented and the ideas that have been seeded so that we can hear what you're thinking and the work you're doing. Uh, Tammy, you, you represent one of those innovative efforts that when All Africa came into being, there was a lot of skepticism about what difference is that going to make and how can that actually succeed. So um, how, how are you doing? How are those middle of the night conversations with yourself going about the work? I'm one of Three, only three non-Africans working for non -Af All Africa. And so my role is to support my talented African colleagues in our offices across the continent. And the nightmare scenario actually collides with the reason for my hope. And the worry is that media funders, investors, are wanting double-digit returns, which few responsible media can make. The hope is that the Silicon Valley unicorns, the billion-dollar new media companies are turning towards serious news, not out of charity, but because a new generation of media consumers, digital media consumers, is demanding it. And one quick example, Vice Media, which is two and a half billion dollar company, hugely profitable, is doing real serious news now, including, for example, a half hour video report on Northeast Nigeria, which has got, got over two million views. And so this is something that gives us hope that this kind of, that shows that serious news is possible. The problem is, so All Africa got to cash neutral status, big magic and mirrors hard work milestone a couple years ago, but declining ad revenues and the growing share of our audience that is African, our global audience that is African, which advertisers and even con branded content, sponsored content people with money don't value as much as they do consumers in the North or the West, uh, means that we still face new challenges. Mm -hmm. We have some strategies to deal with that, and if we get to another round, we'll uh, uh, talk about those. We'll definitely get to another round, um, but let's get the <coughs> microphone <coughs> circulating. Um, for questions, and I just, you know, to that point, not to make this all about money, but uh, I heard uh, someone from the New York Times recently say that they have a larger distribution and readership than they've ever had 
in the history of the magazine because of the digital work, or the history of the newspaper, but less revenue. Mm -hmm. So we still have that uh, issue, and The Guardian is dealing with mm -hmm. very much the same thing. So questions from the group. Yes, question here. And I ask you to identify yourself by organization or affiliation and then make it as brief so we can get to as many people as possible. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Lean. I've um, been covering the environment and sustainable development, often in a campaigning way since 1969 for a succession of British national newspapers. Um, and I've done a lot to sort of, I hope, expose the way we're going. But in old age, I'm more and more wondering whether one of the ways forward, and this isn't actually covered in what you said, is to be reporting on actually the good news stories that are happening around the world. Uh, I, I almost hate to say those words because it's so toxic to journalists. Journalists are allergic to reporting positive stories and for very good reasons. It's, you're absolutely hardwired <coughs> into um, being suspicious. Um, but we are in the middle of the biggest transition since the Industrial Revolution. It's not being reported. I keep bumping into these incredible stories around the world of things that are happening. And if I have a few more years left to me, I would like to invest the time in working out how to report those in a hard, in our terms, journalistic way uh, that would actually carry into the media. Now, does that fit into your vision or, or not, really? Who'd like to take that? Anyone? Well, I mean, it's very much what we do. I mean, we talk about interviewing, I interview on a weekly basis, forward-thinking people from the worlds of arts, activism, and organizing. And I think the good news about what's happening in the United States is not that we've failed. We've fought and been defeated on the progressive side of the spectrum, the side of creative, forward-thinking solutions finding and coming together, but that we haven't really been able to field a team. I mean, frankly, you have to go back 10 years to when you had, you know, Rush Limbaugh first raise the question of Barack Obama's birth certificate, you know, and Rush Limbaugh is the creation of decades of funding by right-wing sources with a vision of how they wanted to change the country. We haven't had that type of investment on the other side of the spectrum. So if you want to develop a human economy, as people talked about last night. We need funders who can have a long-range view, you talked about it, uh, of how do we do that um, culture shift? Because frankly, it's there. I mean, we cover every day uh, the sorts of creative thinking that is bringing people together, that is providing solutions to both technical and, and, and uh, uh, adaptive challenges. And frankly, that is a tiny drop in the bucket of the stories that are out there. The question is, how do we promote those stories and how do we cover the country? And I'm just talking about the United States now in a way that's not either patronizing, oh, those poor, crazy Trump voters, or pathologi pathologi pathologizing, Logical. is that a word? <laughs> pathologizing. Um, oh, they must be so crazy, but actually partnering with them. Like, well, talk about that. How did you respond to the water crisis in Flint? Oh. Fascinating. You managed to work across, across a variety of, of partisan divides. Same thing in Appalachia. Extraordinary, sustainable harvest projects happening that you just never hear about. Right. So I think it's entirely possible. Now is the time. We have more people activated than we've ever had before. We need a media mouthpiece, a, a, a movement media mechanism that could enable those who want to create a human economy to um, develop the, the visibility and the, and the respect, frankly, uh, that they deserve. Appreciate the solution connected to that answer. <coughs> yes. Yes. And there's one, and I'll come to you, Patrick. Hi, can I just pick up what the gentleman here, sorry I didn't catch your name, was talking about, but I don't know if you're aware that there is a growing movement around the world for something called solutions journalism or solutions-focused journalism. It's also called constructive news. And this is very much what you're talking about, getting the media not just to focus on problems, problems, problems. You can report them, but let's also look at the solutions that are out there. And the BBC has recently embraced this. It's called Solutions Focused Journalism there. The Guardian, I know, are very much doing this with their half full half news. Half -half. Um, the Huffington Post, the New York Times does a fixers blog um, written by David Bornstein, who heads up the Solutions Journalism Network in America. I'm running a project called Constructive Voices here, based in the UK, which is about promoting constructive journalism here amongst mm -hmm. journalist editors, journalism students, also trying to find stories showing up the positive impact 
that social entrepreneurs and charities are doing to tackle the big problems we face as a society. So there is a movement out there, and it's you know we need more and more journalists and people involved <coughs> to know about this. And the evidence shows that audiences like those stories; they share them more. They feel uplifted. I don't know about the rest of you. After the um, yesterday's um, opening plenary, I came out energized and inspired by all the amazing things that are going on around the world. When I got back, I checked on Twitter to see what was, you know, happening in the real supposed news, and it was all just such, you know, rubbish and inconsequential compared to the amazing mm -hmm. things that are going on. Yeah. And we need to hear more about those. But this good solutions journalism is one of the responses to the challenges of fake news and propaganda, et cetera. So um, let's let's pick that up later. Uh, Patrick, do you have your hand up? Mic over here. Do we have one or two mics in the room? Seems we have. Oh, there's one. Um, Thank so you. let's get positioned to the next uh, table over there and then we'll come back here. Yeah, um, Patrick Alley, Global Witness. Uh, one insight, a positive insight, and, and a, a more complicated question. The, the insight, I think, is that the gap between traditional journalism and investigative organizations such as Global Witness is actually narrowing, which I think is a very good thing. For example, as we've heard today, traditional media uh, journalism getting philanthropic funding and organizations like Global Witness have been hiring investigative journalists for some years, but partly because there's a, a funding shortfall in investigative journalism um, and partly because of the brilliant skills we, we can use. So I think that's a positive thing and, and I would urge um, you know, people from our respective communities to, to focus on that kind of collaboration. The question is, is more thorny. I, I read a really good article in the FT a few weeks ago saying that fighting fake news with facts simply doesn't work. And in mm -hmm. fact, it reinforces the fake news because mm -hmm. the, head, the, head, the fake headline is the thing that keeps getting repeated. <laughs> yeah. How do we conquer that? Uh, that? We have to answer that question. I mean, some alarming, like not, uh, 80, 90 percent of people believe fake news even when the facts are, are right there parallel. Okay, who wants to take that on? <laughs> a couple of people. Well, let's start with you, Drew, because that's your investigative I journalist. honestly think the fake news issue is a non-issue. I mean, pe people are trained to look at a news story or a structure of a news story and believe it. We we've trained them over 200 years to do that, and unfortunately, that's not true anymore. And so consequently, it'll take some period of time before people understand that you can't necessarily believe the structure and format of, of, of news as, uh, and take that for granted. But I think... You know, there's a lot of um, study into uh, credibility and, and what makes credibility. And I think that, that, you know, we don't always serve our readers in providing the level of interactivity with the data and with the information to allow them to, to learn themselves through our, our news product. We, we, we give a two-dimensional news product that is way, way out of date and it's completely out of touch with the new information. We need to have, you know, money and power is a topography, mm -hmm. and you need to give access to that topography. Most of the important news does not happen in an event-driven news cycle anymore, yet we continue to do that. Mm -hmm. So we need to reinvent journalism and reinvent, especially investigative reporting, to give many more avenues into it and give people the right to interact with the information and to learn themselves. And then, <laughs> then it will be credible, and then they will believe it. Marina? I, I agree with Drew that I think, although I'm all for developing tools for rating, for credibility, and all kinds of other things, but ultimately, once you open up the channels, and that's a history of uh, a lot of media, is that everything pours into it, bad and good. And the problem is that it's harder to find bad, good stuff compared to other things. So I, I don't think that combating fake news uh, is a full solution. I really believe we have a neuroscientist, Melina, here. I, I think we need to do new kinds of collaboration between like neuroscientists mm -hmm. who understand perception of and how people perceive and all of the behavioral scientists, evolutionary biologists about mm -hmm. system. I mean, we created for 30 years with the kind of Fox News and other outlets, we've created a certain kind of immune system that takes those news and believes in them in a certain way. And it's almost, it's very hard to disrupt. And just attacking the fake news is just not gonna do it. 
Well, yes. I go just ahead. wanted to say one thing. You know, I, I worry a lot about the focus on fake news because it feels like it's, it feels like a false. I, I would agree with you. I mean, I, I, I think it's like it's trying to fight an enemy that's very hard to define. And you know, if you, if you look at the rise of fake news, it also complete it, it tracks and corresponds with the decline of trusted media sources. And that's mm -hmm. not just big media. I mean, not big global and national media, but local media that people relied on and can trust. And. You know, I've been in a lot of these conversations since the election, and you know, if there's one thing that worries me, is it's that this is, keeps me up at night. That somehow, like lots of smart people and lots of generous philanthropists and others, will start to invest in how you fix a fake news problem instead of, you know, sort of thinking about the things that actually could work and should work that have just declined because the you know the the model for them collapsed and. Anyway, that, that, that it is, yeah. it, it's an, a worrying trend, I think. Patrice, as an investor, you want to respond to that? Well, I, I must, we've, for 20 years, for 50, 20 years, actually, 21 years, we've been facing fake news because in the authoritarian governments, that's what we face. So point one. Point two, um, I think we've traditionally hit it with trust, building brands in these countries, building the most independent voices, people starting to trust. Zimbabwe bringing Newsday in and suddenly there's a demand. It'll never get to 100% of people reading Newsdays in Zimbabwe. But 25% starts to having an impact, a changing impact in society. But now, 2017, as Rachel says, I think um, just putting more of that, I think we're going to have to look at uh, the disadaptive challenge. I'm sorry, I sound like a broken record. But how do we talk to other people? How do we do I mean, those are, I don't want to get into a long conversation about this, but the key message is that we've been dealing with fake news for 20 years, but now we need something else. And I think the collaboration, which Marina and Rachel have said, of right. different parts of society, I want to, that I think is, I can't stress that enough. Well, I hope that's what this room represents. Wish we had time for your neuroscientist lecture yeah, I agree. on why we yeah. believe this stuff. I agree. But, but we don't. We may have to arrange that at another, <laughs> another time. time. Uh, there, were, there was a hand back there. Did we miss it? Yeah, yes, you. The, and then I'll come back to, to you. Would you stand close by there so we can, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. My name is Astrid Zweinert from the Thomson Reuters Foundation editorial team. And we've been running stories, what we call underreported crisis, underreported stories, for more than 15 years. And I think we've done that sort of solutions journalism even before it became a term. And we find these stories go out on the Reuters wire where they reach millions of readers potentially. And we find that they are among the most popular on our website as well. So, for example, we set up a network of uh, climate change reporters. My, my colleague, Laurie Goering, is here, who, who's been the leading f uh, light on this. And these are, these are reporters who, who, who live this, who are on the forefront of, of countries that are affected by climate change. And this has been a very successful service. And I think investigative journalism is hugely important. But, f I mean, we don't have money to, to do this. We might do it maybe once a year. And I think we, we all have to be sort of brave and proud enough also to give smaller stories prominence and, and say this, this is a good solution and this is a story I want to be running. And uh, I'd, I'd like to hear from the panel perhaps a little bit more on how you do partner with news organizations in developing countries. I mean, All Africa is a great initiative, but um, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more, you know, to, to so, okay. sort of perhaps move it on from being centered on what goes on in the Western world media. Thank you, Astrid. Good question. Would you like to pick up that? Well, Africa has always been, as, as Patrice was suggesting in his world, a, a victim of fake news, even from some of our best news organizations. Uh, its crises have been covered, uh, often badly, and its successes not at all. But there's always been a, a swing of extremes, uh, exemplified by economist covers in successive years of Africa, the disastrous continent, and then Africa mm -hmm. rising, neither of which is true. Mm -hmm. So African colleagues complain that what's lacking is nuance and the recognition that out of despair comes often innovation and creativity. And so we need to provide ways to get at the complexity in simplified ways because people do want to know. And, and Stephen, so much of your new fund is focused on creating collaborations and bringing people together who are doing this work. T talk a little bit more about how that might work. Yeah, and, and you know, we have a history of, of doing this within a Midian network. So uh, a Midian network is a 
is a deliberate term. So we work with each of our investee groups, particularly the independent media ones, bring them together. They look at ways in which they can collaborate on various stories. They look at ways in which they can also help each other with some of the solutions that many of them are, sh uh, are finding that they're, they're facing in terms of business sustainability. You know, where do they get their advertising revenue from? What are the alternatives if you're in the Philippines or if you're in India or if you're in Nigeria? And these are challenging environments. A lot of the advertising is government-led. And if you're speaking out against government, the advertising gets withdrawn. So, so those are the kind of things that we, we look for. I also want to perhaps just ask Gerard, because this is a, a great example of collaboration, you know, with the, the work that ICIJ does around the Panama Papers. And maybe, Gerard, do you want to say a quick few words about how you approach that? Because I think you brought together hundreds of different journalists to, to focus on yes, the Panama and, Papers. And while you're talking about the Panama Papers, just remind us of the full name of the organization. Sure. I'm from the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Look, yeah, I think, you know, I'm actually very optimistic. I think it's great that we're going through bad times because it actually forces us now to innovate. And I think what we're seeing here, the ICIJ, we couldn't have done the Panama Papers 10 years ago because people wouldn't have wanted to collaborate with us. I think because the media is actually struggling, they're now willing to listen to new ways of doing things. And I think this is a fantastic, I, I really think that we have a chance now to re-examine how we do things. And I've, you know, I worked in the commercial media for 30 years before this, and I saw that we weren't actually doing what we were supposed to be doing. We weren't doing things that people, that mattered to people. And I think, you know, I'm optimistic. I think that we now have a chance to remake the media. And I think it's up to philanthropy um, to really innovate in this way, because it's going to be through philanthropy that we're going to do the innovation work that then is going to be copied by the commercial media. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that, by the way. Drew raised his hand, so we're... Yeah, we, we, we actually worked with ICIJ and the Panama Papers, and, and uh, you know, it, it, ten, 10 years ago, we're, we're a consortium of investigative centers, and, and we couldn't get anybody to, to, co to cooperate with us. And now everybody's coming and knocking on our door and want to cooperate because it's cheaper, better, faster when you can get good local people, you know, in an environment. So collaboration really is the key. But I want to add to a point that Patrick made because I think it's very important. You know, we've, we've defined investigative reporting and journalism a little bit more broadly now. And to be honest, I mean, I think we're fooling ourselves if we don't think that the uh, investigative reporting or, or the, the journalism industry is in a death spiral. I mean, if the, you know, the boat is sinking and we're going to have to find new places to stand. And I, I know that's a negative thought, but we should embrace it as the reality. And there's a lot of opportunity in that. And journalism will always exist. It will just find a new home. And it might be in the commons, you know, that Marina always talks about. I mean, journalism is a public need. It has to be there. And we have to find a place for it. Um, and so, so we, we started working with, global, uh, with Transparency International on the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium where we're working with activist groups and we're willing to work with governments, activist groups, you know, political parties, anybody, as long as the truth is getting out and we're not being influenced by the process. You know, it's really important to widen our interest and to find those, those kindred spirits that are interested in uncovering what is being, being you know, covered. And so uh, because we're in such a bad time, I think we need to broaden that scope and we need to be creative about that. So Joe, uh, what time is your delegate-led session today? Let's just remind people. Um, at what time is it, David? <laughs> my, my. Outsourced. It's tomorrow. Th oh, it's tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Well, well, we just I wanted to get that information out because that's exactly what you're going to be talking that's, that's about issue, in a yes. smaller group, and there will be a group of people in here who will want to be sure not to miss that. And, and so. I'll be disagreeing with Drew Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. I so wouldn't so expect so anything so different. So that'll from you, give Dave. us another good reason to come, right, Patrice? You wanted to get in on Pat, this. I've been dodging your question of money two times now. I'm not yes, going to do yes, it Yes, yes, you third have. Time. I think. But I want to bounce on what is just said about reinventing media, and I think that we should also probably look at reinventing funding. Um, I, th I think that by deconstructing what journalism did for society, for civil society, since the Dutch Republic invented Corantos in Amsterdam, by looking at what the value was, perhaps there is a uh, in peace, there is a lead for thinking. And concretely in terms of money, um, I think that, yes, we know media, we work together. Those are the usual suspects. So we're all talking about doing something different together. But what about reaching out to philanthropy that has not? And by, by escalating the subject of what journalism has been done for hundreds of years at civil society, suddenly you start 
ticking to philanthropy that was not typically. Last year, some of you in the rooms know, we brought together 15 billion euros of endowment money in a room for three days in, uh, in Turin, Italy. Three days of trying to solve what the problem at the nexus of civil society and journalism. If you use that model, suddenly you're talking to different people. And I think there's a, there's a bigger, bigger pile, and there is interest, and we are continuing this conversation with people who probably wouldn't come to the media track of school, might not even come to school, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, what I'm trying to say is that I think the, the new reinvention and collaboration of different fields is also probably in terms of the... I hope I've answered the question. Um, yeah, and, and I so appreciate you coming back to that. Laura, I'm going to come to you, but Stephen, you've got a related yeah, uh, just comment. Just a, a point to, to build on what Patrice is saying. I think the other element to this is also encouraging philanthropy in developing countries itself. Yes. Because I think one of the things that we've often been a victim of, and I know many other foundations, is that kind of hand of foreign government. So, you know, we've often been accused as we've in invested in media in different countries around the world, this is, a, this is a front for the CIA or, you know, this is, uh, you know, in the, in the most extreme cases, this is about Pierre Midia wanting to open up eBay and, you know, give, take whatever your country is. So one of the things that we've done deliberately is also try to get together local philanthropists to support this kind of work. So in India, for example, um, the Nandan Nilakani and Rohini mm -hmm. Nilakani, who are uh, the founders of, um, of um, Infosys, software company, big philanthropists in India, are now funding media in India. Mm -hmm. And that, again, takes the sting out of the accusation that you find sometimes in many countries that, oh, this is just foreign uh, meddlers mm -hmm. yes. who are coming to interfere. So I think uh, absolutely we, we, we are proud to make the commitment we're making, but it also needs to come with the commitment from local philanthropists as well to kind of rebalance that. And that is a difference. I'll come back to you, Tammy, but Laura well, Just very quickly, I think when you talked about partnering it with, um, you know, with successful models in developing countries, uh, one of the projects that we're involved in right now, I said I interview people, forward-thinking people from the worlds of arts, activism, and entrepreneurship, is working with new economy entrepreneurs. Because in the sense that, I mean, in, in many ways, our last election result was delivered um, by corporations that put profit ahead of absolutely everything else. And in the same sense that we are talking about creating a human economy that has some broader array of values, um, I think that the businesses in that sector need to think about their relationship to the media that creates the climate that's going to be receptive to their model. So one of the partnerships that we're engaged in, of course, we're always looking for philanthropic support, but we're also partnering with people in the new economy sector, both entrepreneurs to help them tell their stories better, and journalists who've been covering social interests and social justice questions to cover business better, um, particularly this part of the business sector that is about reinventing and, frankly, its success depends on a culture shift um, if it is going to be treated fairly in the marketplace, if those businesses are going to be treated yeah. fairly. So it's ironic for me to be lifting up the kind of commercial aspect of this, but I do think mm -hmm. if the old media funded the, I mean, if the old economy funded the old media, yes. we need the new economy to fund the new media. Mm -hmm. Please. Mm -hmm. So Tammy and then Marina. <laughs> this Omidyar announcement shows wonderful leadership and important progress. However, the new media companies that are wildly successful, the runaway digital unicorns, have had hundreds of millions of dollars of investment each. So it takes a lot to get to a sustainable business model and profitability at All Africa as the only genuinely Pan-African news organization and a collaboration of 130 African news organizations and hundreds, thousands of NGOs, we know that we have to be cheaper and more flexible and better and faster and adapting all the time and to come up with new models. And those are some of the new models that we will be talking about in the other media track sessions. Marina? So I think it's really important what Drew said then from ICAJ is that What's happening with these kind of new models, I and mean, what I see is really exciting, is what is being pioneered is this global networked way of doing investigative journalism that a lot of other parts of our sort of system are actually looking at as a model. So we are going through what's been called the destruction of the administrative apparatus of government. What you're seeing now is the same kind of models that OCCRP, ICAJ is using environmental organizations are creating basically their own almost like investigative mm -hmm. monitoring network. Labor organizations are doing mm -hmm. that also. And there's a lot of, it's, it's not just that journalism is sort of being reinvented, 
but I think they're modeling almost like the new governance system, new tools for governance that are very, very different. And I think that that's where some of the really exciting things are happening, mm -hmm. like labor organizations talking to ICIJ and OCCRP mm -hmm. and learning from these tools that they're using to do large-scale investigation of labor violations along the supply chain. Right. We have, just to remind everyone, have to be out of this room at, at 9.25. So um, if you've got additional questions and we have several hands, please make them short so we can get as many as possible. So j yes, and then Kurt, and then over here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Charlie Sennett, and I'm the founder of the Ground Truth Project. We support a new generation of journalists to tell the most important stories of their generation. I want to agree with Gerard. We've had a chance to work with ICIJ. It's an amazing um, spirit of cooperation and collaboration there, and we're proud to have been part of a couple of your projects. Hope to do more. Um, but I also, I just wanted to say thanks quickly to Suzanne and Marina because this this skull gathering for a lot of us really began late last year at the Future Media Conference. And part of the collaborative ecosystem is those kinds of gatherings. And out of that gathering, we had a chance to share with a lot of people in this room a few ideas about piercing the filter bubble, about talking about civic engagement, media literacy. And we actually have, on Friday, announced the initiative that came out of that meeting. And it's called Crossing the Divide pulling together young journalists from red states and blue states mm -hmm. and doing a um, series of stories about divides in America. But I wanted to just ask, particularly um, Stephen and Patrice, I wanted to say this idea of how does nature correct when an invasive species is there. I, I think youth here is an important part mm -hmm. of this. You know, I, I think a lot of us got to grow up in a time when journalism was blue sky. Yep. And you had a lot of opportunity. I worked for 30 years and loved every day of it. And now I look at this amazing, talented generation with fewer opportunities. And mm -hmm. I think part of what we need to think through to go back to the nature and how do we correct this is how do we get a pipeline uh, for young people to really get mentored, supported, yep. trained uh, for safety, um, and trained for the kind of challenging journalism I think we all want to do. So I just ask, is that part of the equation with the new funding? Right, great. Stephen, I'm just going to take one answer on this so that we can get the other it, questions. It is, yes. Um, and okay. we've, we've supported a number of initiatives in other places around the world. Liberty Africa, for example, does a fantastic job in Johannesburg of training young journalists, mm -hmm. getting them to report in Parliament and so on. Um, well Told Story in Kenya does the same, using new media, using comic books, using a whole range of different production techniques. So that's very much a focus for us. And Charlie, thank you for your work and leadership there. Kurt? Uh, I'm Kirk Hansen. I'm a board, board member of Skoll with Pat, and also I run what is the largest ethics center in the world. That's a small niche uh, <laughs> ethics center. Um, I wanted to put. I wanted to put one more idea on your in your ecosystem as you're thinking about this. Uh, we've convened for a number of years the online digital editors of um, BBC. Uh, 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 PBS, New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera. Uh, and three years ago, they said the fake news problem was the critical one. So for three years, we've been working on what we call the Trust Project. The strategy behind that is to identify a series of meta tags that can be attached to every story that goes out that will demonstrate that this story is trustworthy. And the meta tags include the background of the reporter, the history of the reporting who was talked to, uh, the history of the corrections uh, as we see fact checking procedures, uh, whether the reporter was actually on scene or did it uh, from secondary sources and so on. So that'll be rolled out for the first time this summer. Five European uh, out, uh, news outlets, five American, will be testing these eight meta tags. Uh, and the hope is that Google, who's main funder of this, uh, and Craig uh, Newmark of Craigslist, that Google and, and Yahoo, who are part of the coalition, will use that to bring the stories, reliable stories, to the top of their search results. And that you and I will have an app that will allow us to rate uh, the, the stream of materials we're receiving so that we know the trustworthiness of it. 
But it's anyway, a it's idea. a strategy that's Anybody opposed to this idea? <laughs> a little bit. Um, oh, a little bit, okay. So, so while I think the sentiment is great, and this is something we've been talking about a lot at The Guardian, and... Guardian you know, is a major partner in this. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. Um, um, but but I, I, think, I, I think it's just worth recognizing that there's a slippery slope that undermines the integrity of media when we start to... To, to label journalism that comes from NPR or for the New York Times or from the Washington Post or the Guardian that fundamentally is fact-based. Fact -based. That's what journalism is. And, and I, I, I guess I have a, I mean, I, I was in a couple of conversations at the Guardian earlier about this, but you know, it's, there's, there's just a slightly queasy, uncomfortable feeling about sort of where this may lead us and, um, and who's leading it. You know, I, I mean, to be, we, we're all beholden to Facebook and Google, and those are important partners for us, but they have a particular vested interest in stamping media to solve a problem that they have, and they're a big part of the problem that we have because, you know, they've taken a lot of our revenue. So, I, I mean, I think it's, the sentiment is the right one, but I just, I don't think there's a simple solution on this, and I think that there's a risk to the integrity of journalism if we're not careful. All right, we have less than three minutes left, so I can only take one question. I saw your hand first, so I apologize Hi. Uh, to Hi. the others. It's okay, I can speak loudly. I'm Kitty Boone with the Aspen Institute. Um, lots of interesting thoughts about this, but the one thing that you started speaking about, Pat, was trust. Mm. And I read the New York Times every day, but it's not lost on me that the New York Times, which I love, also editorializes in a lot of its stories. And I think that's where trust begins to break down. So the question is, how do you actually get audiences that might not read you or listen to you or watch you to begin to trust you again? All right, Drew, yeah. quick. Well, I mean, you, got, you had 30 seconds on this one. The, 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 the problem with the New York Times is, you know, it's, it's an upper middle class newspaper. You're all upper middle class people here. And, you know, the, the people who are not reading it are lower middle class people. And that's where, the, the, you know, a lot of the problems are in society. So, you, you know, you, you need to gear your newspaper towards the needs of the people. If you don't address their issues, they don't trust you, almost by definition. If they don't see the stories, if they don't see themselves in the newspaper, they don't trust you. And so really it's a matter of gearing your news coverage to the people you want to read. New York Times, quite frankly, doesn't care that people in the Rust Belt read them. That's not who their advertising base is. They don't care. So they shouldn't really be belly aching at this point that people aren't believing them in, in certain parts of the country. So, you know, you, 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 journalism used to be a blue collar industry and it's really not. It's now become an upper middle class industry and there's a large number of people that we're not addressing and we have to go back and address those people and I think that will solve a lot of the trust issue. This has been such an engaged conversation. I can't think of the right way to end it because there have been so many good ideas put forward, but I'll just put the panel on, on the spot one more time to do a quick wrap-up on if you had the magic, for, no, if somebody said, okay, you're God or goddess today, uh, what does the ecosystem look like in five years that could address many of the problems that we've surfaced and challenges we've surfaced? You can pick up an idea you've already heard or put, in, put forth a new one. I would implement at All Africa what I think has wider implications for media in general, which is to respond to the demand that we are getting, which we can't yet really fulfill, to be a platform, a neutral convening platform for cross-border sharing of common problems and common solutions and new ideas and innovations. Getting past the fault line, Stephen. Um, I mean, I'd like to see in five years' time a resurgence of trust-based media around the world. Patrice? I would like You're going to give it a lot of money, whatever the idea is, right? <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm just... No, 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 you're right. But I, I think that I would like to see that we have drawn in other parts of the philanthropical capital in, in civil society, but that we will have failed a few experiments because comp adaptive challenges require failure. And then we will may have, out of 10 ideas, we might have found something that would have dealt with the subject of, of, of structure, of funding, mm -hmm. civic media, but mm -hmm. also trust. Good idea. Uh, I guess I, I'd like to see the ways in which we can foster more partnership between, you know, sort of the bigger media and the smaller media and taking advantage of the, the scale um, mm -hmm. that's out there um, and, and strengthening the kinds of relationships between the two to make it possible for the smaller media organizations to survive. Marina? I, I think this is like the age of unlikely alliances and collaborations and where I would go is really bring 
journalists into other domains yes. like labor organizations, other mm -hmm. civic organizations, mm -hmm. neuroscientists, all of these to see what mm -hmm. kind of alliances and sharing of tools can be developed. And great. A Laura. cooperative platform is entirely possible that includes content being produced by the organizations that you mentioned that don't consider themselves necessarily journalistic organizations, but are producing extraordinary amounts of content. Um, and a place where we could go for both news and views, but with transparency as to where it's coming from. We're up against an authoritarian economy and mm -hmm. political system. We need pluralism, and I, th I think we can figure out how to, to share. And if we can have an e-commerce base for our new media platform, so much the better. I'll take all of those. <laughs> <laughs> and so will I. So the, at the end of the day, we're all media consumers. We all know media matters. So go forward and collaborate. Thank you.